Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So happy Friday, and I'd like to welcome all of you to another exciting week of Frontier Seminar Series on behalf of all the committee members. So I'm Devesh Ranya, faculty member in the School of Mechanical Engineering, and it's an exciting series so far. So thank you for everyone who has supported it uh, week and every week. So this week, uh, our theme for the seminar is on the data science and data analytics. And I'll go ahead and introduce our moderator, and moderator will take the honor of introducing our distinguished speaker, uh, Dean Jati Murthy. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Yogi Joshi, who is our, our colleague in the school, and also John M. McKinney and Warren D. Shiva, distinguished chair in building mechanical system. Um, Yogi has been known in the area of data sciences and thermal management. That's his area. He has a list of award. I'll not name them, but uh, more than that, he has a great mentor for junior faculty member in the school, including myself and others who, who have worked with him. He was a fellow of ASME. He's a, he's a fellow of AAAS. Uh, but more than that, he was also recognized from ASME Heat Transfer Group for the Heat Transfer Memorial Award. Uh, he has helped people across different areas on thermal sciences problem. So not just looking at uh, uh, research in his own lab, but also how do you translate that research? So he has a, he's also an entrepreneur with a company he has just started. So he's looking at how do we go from creating research to translating them into a problem and uh, devices which can solve some of these challenging problems. With that, Yogi, it's all yours. Thank you, Devish, for the overly generous uh, introduction. Uh, so it's uh, an honor today to introduce uh, Dean Jayati Murthy. Uh, she's the Ronald and Valerie Sugar Dean at the UCLA Henry Samueli School of Engineering and Applied Science, which has 190 faculty and more than 6,000 undergraduate and uh, graduate students. And um, Dr. Murthy is also a distinguished professor in the mechanical and uh, aerospace engineering department there. Uh, of course, uh, she has a very, very long and distinguished uh, bio, so I will just uh, touch on some of the sort of key accomplishments of Dean Murthy's. Uh, her research interests are in nanoscale heat transfer, computational fluid mechanics and uh, heat transfer uh, for uh, various industrial applications. Uh, recently, she's been focusing on submicron thermal transport, multi-scale, multi-physics simulations of uh, micro nano electro mechanical systems uh, and uncertainty quantifications involved in those systems. In fact, uh, that uh, would be some of the topics that she would be touching upon today as well. Uh, before she joined uh, UCLA as the first uh, woman dean of engineering in January 2016, she was the chair of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at uh, the University of Texas in Austin, where she also held uh, the Ernest Cockrell Memorial Chair. Um, and prior to that, she was at uh, Purdue uh, and Carnegie Mellon Universities. Uh, from 2008 to 2014, she uh, was also the director for the Center for Prediction of Reliability, Integrity, and Survivability of Microsystems, or PRISM. And uh, uh, she will, I believe, be talking a little bit about that uh, work uh, as well. Uh, this was funded through the National Nuclear Security uh, Administration. Um, she was early in her career uh, an employee uh, at the uh, New Hampshire based Fluent uh, uh, Corporation, and she was, in fact, a developer of some of the algorithms that are part of the software uh, even today uh, in the computational uh, fluid dynamics area. Uh, Dr. Murthy received her PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Minnesota uh, under Professor Patankar and her uh, master's de MS degree from Washington State University, her undergraduate degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, which is where she and I overlapped. So actually I've known her for a very long time. Uh, it's a pleasure really to have her uh, here to, and, and to, uh, to speak to us. Uh, she has many, many awards to her credit, including the ASME Heat Transfer Memorial Award, ASME Electronics and Photonics Packaging Division, Clock Award, um, she is uh, a member of the National Academy of Engineering and also a foreign fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. Uh, so with that, uh, Jayati, the floor is all yours. Looking forward to your presentation. 
Chat Young. Can I share my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. So in, in the time chat is sharing the screen for audience, if you want to mute your uh, mic and video also in the time. And at the same time, if you have a question during the seminar, just put that in the chat and we'll take the Q&A at the end of the seminar. Excellent. Thank you. So th thank you, Devesh. Thank you, Yogi. Uh, for all of you, you should know that Yogi and I were actually lab mates uh, very early in our youth. And it's a singular pleasure to be here uh, being introduced by him and having him moderate the session. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes, we can see you and hear you fine, Daisy. Excellent. Thank you. And, you know, I really have to commend uh, the organizers of this uh, series. Uh, you know, this is such a phenomenal thing to be doing in the middle of COVID, and I hope it survives COVID and we continue to get together all across the country. It's uh, really wonderful. One of the good things to come out of this whole crisis, I would imagine. So, uh, yeah, so I'm quite excited to talk to you uh, today about uh, this particular topic, Beyond CFD, Possible Computational Futures in Thermal Sciences. Um, you know, and, and in some sense, it's actually uh, more exciting to talk about this than to delve deep into a single topic because it allows us to pull back and take a broad look at where we're headed. And that's what I'm trying to do. Hello? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Please. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so let me try to do that. All right. So today, what I'm going to try to do is to pull back and look at where we're headed computationally in the thermal sciences and what the possible opportunities are. All right. So a little bit of history. Uh, it's interesting that uh, computational fluid dynamics, or something that looks like computational fluid dynamics, has been around really, you know, for more than a century now. And uh, one of the earliest proponents of this uh, whole idea or method was uh, Lewis Fry Richardson. And, uh, you know, who started to do some of this work as early as 1910, long before computers existed. And he was uh, looking at uh, iterative solutions to Laplace's equation, really using finite difference methods, right? Looking at things like flows over cylinders and actually using uh, kids uh, to do, uh, you know, the calculations. So he would actually seat all his kids in a grid and they were computing the Laplacian uh, through finite difference methods. And he would actually pay them for correct computations uh, and imagine doing computations in this way. And he was a really uh, amazing guy and in fact started to look at mathematical theories for war and has published uh, quite a lot. But what's really interesting is that this started long before we were actually able to do uh, large scale simulation of any kind. So looking at the history of computational fluid dynamics generally, again, you see exactly that same kind of arc. Uh, relaxation methods uh, were developed uh, right through the 1920s through the 50s. Uh, those of you who work in uh, CSD know the courant friedrich lewy condition, the CFL condition for hyperbolic equations developed as long back as 1928. Von Neumann stability criteria for parabolic problems, 1950s. Uh, Haller and Fromm in 1963 actually computed unsteady uh, flow over a cylinder. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this actually kicked off the whole idea of doing numerical experiments. Uh, there was an article in Scientific American that was published in 1965. Uh, my own advisor, uh, Suhas Patankar, and his advisor, uh, Brian Spaulding, uh, developed boundary layer codes. In fact, that was uh, the topic of Suhas's uh, PhD thesis. This was in the 60s. Uh, and, uh, and from that came a lot of pioneering work uh, from the Imperial College group and others uh, doing incompressible flows. And this was all built through the 1970s, pressure-based methods for incompressible flows. Uh, the CFD world was ignited uh, by Tony Jameson's work uh, on Euler flow over a complete aircraft in 1988. And that really opened up everyone's eyes to the sheer potential of computational methods in CFD. Uh, and then through the 90s, we developed uh, a whole class of unstructured mesh methods, which uh, really opened up industrial CFD. 
Now, of course, this is a very particular view of a very particular corner of CFT, largely dealing with incompressible flows, which is what you know mostly my own work is focused on. But there's a whole other world uh, doing compressible flows. There's a, and these are, again, largely finite volume methods we're talking about here. There's a whole other world of finite element methods, which I will not touch on. Right, so, so this is the broad history, and this is where we are. Computation is getting bigger and bigger, uh, more and more physics. So where do we go from here? Right, so if you look at, so, you know, actually, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about mainstream CFD. Uh, I'll focus on a, a related adjacent area. Uh, but if you look at CFD currently, uh, what remains to be done? Right, I would say it's a relatively mature area. But there are some bottlenecks. Uh, one of them is mesh generation, which remains a huge bottleneck in industrial CFD. Uh, you know, your average industrial partitioner will spend much more time creating a mesh than actually doing the computation. And this is really a people heavy activity, whereas computation, you know, you can just throw that on a computer and go away and have your cup of coffee, can't do that with mesh learning yet. Uh, a number of physics remain unresolved. Turbulence is, you know, the perpetual issue. Uh, the entire class of multi-phase flow, particularly gas liquid flows and phase change, all the regime transitions that occur are today not yet uh, computable from first principles. Uh, similarly, combustion remains a big open issue tied centrally to turbulence and the modeling of turbulence. So that's a big issue. Uh, truly integrated multi-physics remain uh, problematic. Uh, in the sense that we don't have a coherent set of methodologies. Finite elements actually is far more integrated than most finite volume uh, schemes. Uh, and then there's the whole area of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and all uh, the stuff that that opens up in the thermal sciences in terms of modeling, reduced order models, uh, computational techniques, uh, and so on. And so that I think is really a kind of an exciting area for us to be plumbing. Right? But what I'm going to do today is not actually focus on the core CFD itself, but to pose a different uh, problem and a different set of opportunities. And so I am interested in this talk today in talking about a computational framework for decision making. All right. So what, what does that really mean? So if you look at a, a really complex industrial problem uh, and you're trying to uh, resolve it, uh, you know, computationally. So, for example, let's say that you're going to be you're looking to build a, an aircraft engine or something like that. Uh, and you're using computation to design it. You're doing experiments uh, and you want, you know, an engine that delivers a certain thrust. Um, how do you go about? Uh, creating uh, the set of computations and the set of experiments uh, to achieve that end, right? So if you want to do that, you realize that information is actually available at multiple levels. I mean, you have inputs, you have parameters, you have models, all of these things have uncertainty associated with them. Uh, your information is heterogeneous, so there are multiple sources of information, you've got experiments, uh, you've got measurements, you've got expert opinion, you've got models, you've got historical legacy data, all with different levels of scales and errors and resolutions. Uh, and the real question we're asking here is, it's not really a question of here I do a CFD simulation, I compare it to data, and I say whether it's accurate or inaccurate to a certain percent. That's not what we're trying to do, though that's a part of it. The real question we're trying to ask is, how do you fuse all available information, whatever level of accuracy and resolution it's at, to uh, quantify uncertainty in a system level prediction. How do you use it all? And then how do you use these system level predictions to make decisions about where to go next? All right. So if you're not getting the thrust that you want, what is it that you want to fix? Uh, do you want to do more experiments? Do you want to do more simulations? Where does the problem lie? Where do you invest your money, your time, your people? It's that kind of framework that I'm really talking about. All right? How do you use everything that you know about your system to make decisions? Right? So, uh, and and of course, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that our uh, you know, engineering systems are rife with uncertainty. Uh, for example, biological systems. Right? I mean, if you are a bioengineer or a biomedical engineer. 
and you're looking to do biological simulations, so much about these systems is unknown or imperfectly known. So huge uncertainties in parameters, huge uncertainties in models. But even in engineered systems, there are very big uncertainties, right? So on the right-hand side here, uh, what you see is an, a, a plot. Uh, this is really the effective thermal conductivity of a shallow bed of spherical particles, all right, of different sizes. Uh, to, uh, with relevance to selective laser sintering, which I'm sure is a process that most of you know, where you have a thin bed of particles, you are zapping it with a laser in order to sinter it and make 3D built parts. And so what you're seeing here is a uh, ratio of uh, dimensionless conductivity of the bed. Okay, so this is just not the, you know just conduction, but also radiation between particles are included versus uh, the depth of the bed non-dimensionalized by the particle radius, right? And the bars that you see here are uncertainty bands. And you see that there are huge uncertainties for very shallow beds, where the bed depth is only a few, you know, couple of times the particle diameter, which is not, you know, unusual in uh, selective laser sintering operations. Uh, and so uh, why do you get this kind of uncertainty? Because, you know, the arrangement of individual particles actually begins to matter when you get to very shallow beds. And so there are, and there are many, many such uh, examples in engineering where there are inherent uncertainties and then there are many, many unknowns, both in inputs and models and so on. So you have to be able to address this if you're going to do any kind of use of uh, simulations for decision-making and uncertainty quantification. So for those of you who don't work in this area, uh, you'll see a bunch of different uh, ways of talking about uncertainty and two different kinds, really. One of them is what we call aleatoric uncertainty. Aleatoric uncertainty is really uncertainty related to natural variability, all right? So you're conducting an experiment, uh, you can't quite control your system, so the inlet velocity to your setup varies. You know, somebody opens a window, the temperature changes, you know, the air conditioner comes on, your data are contaminated by these kinds of things. This is aleatoric uncertainty. Uh, there is then the whole idea of epistemic uncertainty, which is different. This is uncertainty about the state of knowledge. You, you, you have imperfect knowledge. Uh, for example, you don't, you know, you have imperfect turbulence models or combustion models. Uh, that would be epistemic uncertainty. Right, so the, both of these occur in uh, engineering simulations, and how do you deal with them? So uh, what I want to talk about today is the Bayesian framework for uncertainty quantification and decision making. Right, so let's say that you've got you know some kind of engineering system that you're trying to simulate, and you've got inputs into the system: inlet velocities, temperatures, boundary conditions. Uh, which are imperfectly known, typically aleatoric uh, in terms of uncertainty, and aleatoric uncertainties uh, can be described with inputs that are distributions, right? PDFs. Uh, you have other kinds of uncertainties. You have parameters in your model. You're running a turbulence model. There are parameters in there. Those are unknown perfectly and may themselves be uh, described by PDFs. Now, in a Bayesian framework, uh, it's interesting that you might have, of course, you'd have model form uncertainties. Your turbul turbulence model is not well known. Other things in a property, other things are not well known. Uh, you could model those kinds of unknowns also through a probabilistic framework, right? And there are model form errors or uncertainties that can be added to your governing equation. So a Bayesian framework allows both aleatoric and epistemic uncertainties to be modeled as uh, probability density functions as distributions. Right? And from this framework comes an output or outputs whose, out whose form is also probabilistic. Right? You basically get a PDF out of this. And uh, so our entire view of the world then becomes probabilistic. And the kinds of questions that we want to answer here are, how do you decrease the uncertainty in your output. What do you change in your input? What do you change in your parameter uncertainties, model form uncertainties? How do you decrease the uncertainty in your input, uh, in your outputs? What outputs are most important? Do you need more data? Do you need more simulations? What is the accuracy you need in your inputs to get a certain degree of certainty in your outputs? 
So this is really what one might call a global sensitivity, right? So you're really looking at uh, a global range of uh, parameters in your output. You've got a PDF, and the question is, how do I change my input PDFs, my parameter PDFs in such a way as to make my outputs more certain, right? And so what is certainty? Certainty is really a delta function at the value that you want. Uh, what is uncertainty? Perhaps a uniform distribution across all values would be, you know, an uncertain state where you really don't know what you're getting. If all states are equally probable, right? So this is a framework for it, and yeah, and you can see that you know sensitivity in this framework would, is really a global uh, sensitivity. You're talking about a responsive outputs to inputs across a range of parameters. Right now, let's go take a look at something that is simpler. And this is the whole idea of sensitivities and adjoints, not globally, but locally. That is, at a given operating condition, what is the dependence of my output to my input? So this is a local sensitivity, and I want to talk about that for just a couple of minutes. This is also a very useful way, useful way of evaluating uh, your systems. So the question we're asking is, at a particular point of operation, what inputs yield the desired output. You may want to also talk about what one calls a tangent uh, problem, which is how does a specific output affect, or a specific input affect all outputs. Uh, you may want to uh, also talk about an adjoint problem where a specific uh, you, question you're asking is how does a specific output, uh, how is it affected by all inputs? And, and you can use these kinds of answers to determine the effect of uncertainties and tolerances. You might be able to plan experiments better. And indeed, you can actually do better CFD. You can Im improve single point simulations by looking at uh, the uh, sensitivity of your outputs to meshes, uh, to iteration parameters, and so on. So it can be used in many creative ways. So the main uh, message I'm trying to take away here is there's really two different kinds of sensitivities we're talking about. One is global sensitivity, as is captured in uh, the previous slide, described by probability density functions. And we're talking here about local sensitivity, which is essentially the derivative of outputs with respect to inputs at a particular operating point. All right, so, so let's talk about this local sensitivity first, and then I'll talk much more broadly about uncertainty. So if you were to, what is a local sensitivity calculation? It's really nothing but a Jacobian. Uh, you've got M outputs, you've got N inputs, and really a Jacobian is the gradient of, uh, you know, is the derivative of the Mth output with respect to the Nth input. Right? So you basically have, uh, you know, an M by N uh, matrix, if you like. Right, so uh, you can compute these to a variety of approaches. One is a continuous approach where you take the PDE, for example, your MG equation, and you want its sensitivity with respect to something, maybe the specific heat or something else. You can actually simply derive a sensitivity version of the PDE by differentiating the PDE, right? And so you create a new PDE, you discretize it, you solve it, uh, and you can certainly do that. Uh, it's not a great way of doing business because every time you want a different sensitivity, you want a derivative of temperature with respect to CP or thermal conductivity, you have one kind of equation. You want the sensitivity of temperature with respect to the heat transfer coefficient at some boundary, you have a different PDE. Every time you create a PDE, you have to discretize it, you have to solve it. It's generally a very complicated way of doing business. We prefer not to do it that way. Uh, we have a disc you can use a discrete approach, and here what you do is you discretize your original PDE, your energy equation, and then posteriori uh, add sensitivities or adjoints. And I'll tell you what this is in just a minute. All right, so uh, we do this through the idea of automatic code differentiation. All right, and I'll take I'll take a few slides to uh, work through this. Um, so what does that actually mean? So let's say, uh, and this is a very simple example, you've got uh, X, which is a function of an input U, uh, and then Y is a function of X, and Z is a function of uh, Y, so you've got a concatenation of functions connected to each other, and you want to differentiate, 
factors, right? You want to find the sensitivity. Uh, and let's say that your goal is really to find partial Z, partial U. So partial of Z with respect to U, right? Now, uh, let's differentiate this. So X prime is partial F, partial U, U prime, and so on all the way. Now, I haven't said what prime is. What does prime mean? What is it a derivative of? Uh, well, it's up to you to decide. So let's say that I said I will set U prime to be one, right? What does that mean? Uh, U prime is a derivative of U with respect to something. And if it's one, you're really denoting, you're saying that this is the derivative of U with respect to U itself. And so all primes, if you make a choice of U prime equal to one, all primes are derivatives with respect to U, all right? And so if you uh, follow this through, if you set U prime equal to one, X prime is partial X partial U, and then Y prime is partial Y partial U, and all the way down, if you follow through that concatenation of operations, you will end up with an answer, which is partial Z partial U, right? So that's, that's the idea. So keep that in mind while I show you a more direct example. All right, so here we go. So let's uh, let's work out a very simple example here. So I've got a, a function. P is a function of, is 3x squared plus sine y. X and y are inputs. And so P is one of the outputs. And then I've got another guy, Q, which is P divided by y, say, just a random example, right? So X and y are inputs, P and Q are outputs. Right, so what I'm going to do is go through what you might call an elemental decomposition, which is really looking at a bunch of in, uh, intermediate computations. P1 is the first part of this guy. P2 is three times, you know, X times X. P3 is sine Y. P, which is the output function, is T2 plus T3. Q is P divided by Y. All right, nothing else. We're just sort of breaking it down roughly in the way that your computer might do it. And now let's take a look at derivatives, all right? So P1 prime, which is the derivative of P1 with respect to something, we'll say what that something is in a minute. Uh, if you were to find derivatives, this is really nothing but, you know, chain rule kind of stuff. So simple arithmetic gets you to the bottom. So prime means derivative, and we will decide what derivative with respect to what in just a minute. Right, so we've done the set of basic calculations. Now let's take a look at doing some interesting uh, arithmetic here. Right, so this is just the previous slide. So you have uh, a record of it. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have inputs, a particular point uh, of operation, x equal to 10, y equal to 5 by 3. And I'm going to set x prime equal to 1 y prime equal to zero. Okay, this is my input to the chain of operations that we saw. I'm going to pass these through uh, all of these uh, operations you saw. And if you were to do that and get to the end of it, you'll see that you compute P prime equal to a number 60 because you've got inputs at a particular value. And if you were to go do your arithmetic, you'll see that this is actually dpdx at x equal to 10, y equal to pi by three. You do the same thing and find Q prime, you'll find that Q prime is this number here. And if you do your arithmetic, you'll see that this is DQ DX at that particular point of operation. Do the same thing at the same point of operation, but now with X prime equal to zero, Y prime equal to one, all right? Whereas this one you did with respect to X prime equal to one, do the same thing and you'll find numbers P prime and Q prime which are dp dy at the point of operation, dq dy at the point of operation. So you see, you see what's going on. So basically what we're saying is when you set x prime equal to one, you're signaling this whole concatenation of operations that you, your derivatives are with respect to x, right? x prime equal to one means dx dx, so that's equal to one. By setting y prime equal to one, you are signaling your concatenation of operations that you want derivatives with respect to y, and that's exactly what you're getting. Right now, this looks like magic. It, of course, is not. You can absolutely convince yourself that th these derivatives are absolutely exact. And so what did we actually get? We got exact derivatives of uh, the variable of interest whose pr uh, with respect to the variable uh, whose prime was set unity, right? This is not a finite different uh, approximation. This is an exact value. 
And uh, we saw that in order to get this, every variable in its prime must be stored. We are obtaining numerical values of the derivative, not symbolic. And you can convince yourself that this process would work through loops and conditionals and iterations and so on, right? So this is the basic idea of automatic code differentiation. So how do you do it? Uh, in a code such as a fluent or whatever else, uh, what we'd like to do is to convert a code that does CFD to also do sensitivities to give us derivatives of the type we're talking about. That's what we're trying to do here. Right, and this idea can be easily done in codes written in languages such as C and uh, such as C++ uh, through templating and operator overloading. So what you do is uh, you have a regular variable v, but a templated variable contains two different bits in this case z, and it also carries a derivative z prime. So when you talk about a variable, it's really two things z and z prime, and we also use Operator overloading. What is operator overloading? Operator overloading is a way of telling the compiler that, for example, uh, multiplication, a star, uh, does two things, right? So when it works on the first variable, it does a regular multiplication. When it works on the second variable in your templated variable, uh, it carries out the chain rule. Right, so the word so star now means something much more complex than it would in regular arithmetic. Uh, depending on which part of your templated variable it's working on, it does different things. So on the first member, it does regular multiplication. On the second member, it effectively does your chain rule. Right, and you can do this to any function. Right, so for example, if you've got cosine, uh, you know, for, on the first variable, when you apply a cosine, it does a regular cosine. It, on the second part of the variable. Uh, it will do uh, a derivative, which is minus sine x, x prime, and so on, right? So, so we use the idea of operator overloading uh, to uh, essentially take uh, a regular code, we redefine our variables by templating, we redefine operations by operator overloading, and this can be done without changing every line of your code. You can just do it through includes. And what it does is it does something very powerful, which is that it takes a regular code and essentially converts it into a code that can actually find your derivatives, no matter how complex your code actually is. Right? So we're not talking about only functions, we're talking about an entire code, which is a concatenation of uh, functions really. And you can convert that into a code that actually does sensitivity pretty straightforwardly if you use uh, a language such as C++. Right? So the compiler essentially does it, all right? So suppose you had a regular C++ code, very simple. It consists of some, uh, you know, doubles, X and Y, uh, P and Q, and this is your function, and you're trying to find P and Q, your regular code would just give you values of P and Q, right? But now if you were to use templating and operator overloading, uh, we define a new class, a template class, where the variable T is really two things. It's a value and it's, and it's derivative. It looks, the code looks exactly like your original code. Nothing is different other than that you change uh, the class of the variable. Uh, but every operation here does not only the regular arithmetic operation, but because uh, stars and signs and divides have all been overloaded, uh, you can also get derivatives out of this, all right? So that's the power of this method. So the class T contains uh, value and its uh, derivative and all operators are overloaded. So once you do this, at compile time, you can actually get sensitivities out of your entire code. So big commercial codes like Fluent, if written in C++, uh, can in fact yield a lot of information, sensitivity information, pretty straightforwardly. Right now, we've been using this to do many things. Uh, here's a uh, very simple example. And what we're trying to do here is really doing uh, you know, um, molecular dynamics computation, for example, uh, or, you know, submicron simulations. And uh, we've got, in this case, uh, graphene uh, described by a Tersoff potential. So you set up all your atoms. And what I'd like to do is to get the third derivative of the potential energy with respect to atomistic positions. Uh, and, and we need these for anharmonic simulations and other things, right? Now you can do this in two different ways. 
One is to use a, say, in this case, a second order final difference method to get the derivative. Or you can do code differentiation of the type that I talked about, where you have a function for the test of potential and you pass it through an automatic code differentiation process. Now, finite differences, you guys all know this, and you know that the accuracy of a finite difference model depends on uh, delta x, uh, which is uh, the change uh, in atomistic position, uh, and you basically describe a delta x and go find a third derivative. Of course, the accuracy depends on delta x, so you see that the red line here, which is uh, the third derivative computed uh, using finite differences, uh, gets uh, more and more accurate as the delta x is decreased, and that you definitely see. Uh, but you see something very interesting, right? As delta x tends to zero, uh, this finite difference uh, approximation can give you very real messes because uh, the top's going to, uh, you know, the bottom and the top have to reach, have to hit the limit at the same rate. And if you don't do that computationally correctly, you can get very wrong answers. Now, automatic code differentiation, of course, doesn't care about delta x at all. You get the same answer no matter what, because it's not a finite difference approximation, and you get exact answers uh, regardless of delta x. It doesn't use the idea of delta x at all. Right? Now, we've used this to compute uh, things like dispersion curves very straightforwardly. We uh, use this to find uh, force constants in atomistic simulations, uh, compute group velocities very accurately. All of these things are just derivatives of functions, and we can, uh, once we have, uh, you know, a terse of potential available to us, all of these can be uh, automatically computed with very high accuracy. Right? So I won't say too much more than that. Uh, other kinds of derivatives, for example, here is the temperature sensitivity of the specific heat of uh, graphene nanoribbons. Uh, so this is really, uh, you know, so we can find how the specific heat varies with temperature. Uh, of very, so these are derivatives of very complicated uh, functions where the uh, frequency really comes from an eigen problem solution. Uh, but even such complicated functions, we can get very, very uh, accurate, absolutely accurate uh, computations of derivatives. All right. So, so the sensitivity idea can be used to do. Uh, many, many different kinds of derivatives. Now, it's not just point functions you can do this way. You can actually begin to evaluate and understand entire flow fields this way. And so here's a, a turbine blade cooling example. So, you know, very abstracted, of course. Uh, so this green surface here is the surface of your turbine blade. Uh, you've got a coolant being injected uh, in order to cool the surface. Outside is the hot gas flow, and so this is a very classic heat transfer problem. And what we'd want to do is to compute the sensitivity of the flow and temperature fields and maybe effectiveness uh, to various parameters, potentially hot gas inlet velocity, temperature, uh, et cetera. Right? So, uh, so here we are. Uh, so let's take a look at this problem. Now, I showed you sensitivities with respect to uh, Simple functions, right? Specific heat, derivative of specific heat with respect to temperature. Here we're talking about sensitivities of entire fields of computation. So if you were to go run a fluent or something like that and actually compute the flow field and the temperature field, here's a, a contour plot of the U velocity field in a simple abstracted representation of uh, you know of the CFT problem that you saw before, the, the diagram that you saw before. What this is, is really a derivative of the U velocity field with respect to the inlet velocity, right? So this is saying, what is the sensitivity of my entire velocity field with respect to the incoming velocity, which is a boundary condition in our flow, all right? So, so we're not talking about just derivatives of individual functions with respect to whatever parameters. We're now talking about the derivatives of entire fields with respect to the flow field. And you can kind of make sense of this, right? So uh, I've got a flow coming in here at U main. That's your boundary condition. I've got a coolant flow coming in here, and that sets up my velocity field. You can see the boundary layer of my velocity field, or the U velocity here. And this is telling me that the sensitivity of this velocity here with respect to the inlet is very high, which is what you would expect. 
the sensitivity of the U velocity field in the coolant induction is non-existent with respect to the flow here because this guy is really isolated geometrically from that guy, which is what you might expect, right? So you can get a lot of information about uh, the flow field sensitivity by looking at these field variations uh, of these derivatives. Right? Now, you can use it for other things as well. So, for example, here's a, uh, you know, this has nothing to do with sensitivity. This is how you use derivatives from automatic code differentiation. Here's a topology optimization problem. For those of you who work in topology optimization, here it is. So, we've got a square domain in this particular case, all insulated all around. It contains uh, a material with a volumetric heat source. And here's a boundary condition. This is, uh, you know, a, a boundary at a given temperature. And generally, if you have a volumetric heat source here, uh, heat flows from the inside to the outside. Now you're given uh, in this problem uh, a high conducting material. All right. So you're given 40% of this volume is high conducting material. And the question we're asked is, what is the distribution of this high conducting material in this volume so as to minimize the mean temperature in the domain? All right, so that's what we've got. So you've got uh, material one, which has a certain thermal conductivity, a certain volume fraction. You've got material two, which is a different thermal conductivity, different volume fraction. And the problem you're asking to pose is determine the distribution of this high conducting material so as to minimize the cost function. In this case, the cost function is the mean temperature. You want to minimize that subject to PDE constraints. All right, you've got your energy equation and you've got boundary conditions. And so how do you place this material in this volume so as to achieve this minimum temperature? That's the problem you're trying to solve. Right now, you can do that. And in, in fact, you get really fascinating answers for different conductivity ratios. And I'll let you puzzle over those when the conductivity ratio is very high, very, very high conducting material uh, in a low conducting material. These are the kinds of structures you can actually derive. Uh, and, uh, and as that ratio becomes more, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what's going on here with the annotation? Okay, so as that, uh, and as that, uh, you know, structure becomes, uh, as the conductivity becomes more comparable, you get, you know, different answers. But mainly what I'm trying to say here is that my sensitivity, uh, the sensitivity of the cost function to the material distribution requires the calculation of derivatives because this is really an optimization problem. Uh, and then so, uh, and we use automatic code differentiation uh, to do this kind of thing. Right? So there we are. So, um, I'm sorry, how do I turn off this uh, annotation thing here? I'm sorry. I'm going to turn this off. On your, on your left side, there's an annotation. You can on just go left. On the left, it says annotate. Oh, oh sorry. I yeah. think I've turned that on. I, I, I would like to turn that off. How do I turn that just off? push the mouse button. I think that's the second one. Oh, okay. I'm not able to. Sorry. Can I just turn this off altogether? Okay. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so now, uh, so that's another use for automatic code differentiation. All right, so how are we doing on time? Okay, another, maybe another quick 10 minutes. We are good on time. Okay, good, excellent. All right, so uh, I want to show you another important and interesting use of automatic code differentiation for uncertainty quantification, All right? So here what we're doing is something entirely different. Now, I've got, say, an energy equation, right? del dot of k graph t equal to source or something else. But this problem is interesting because uh, thermal conductivity is not a constant, right? Let's say that the thermal conductivity, we have uncertainty in the thermal conductivity. And so we want to model the thermal conductivity as a probabilistic variable. And so uh, I've postulated a form here. It could be something else. But we're saying that the thermal conductivity is 1 plus a random variable epsilon times x, right, which is position. Now, uh, I can specify what epsilon is. Let's say that it's a normal distribution with a certain mean and a certain variance. And so my epsilon is a PDF, 
which makes my thermal conductivity also a PDF. And so my question then is, given this uh, input thermal conductivity, what is the PDF of temperature that I would predict? All right. So if you had uncertainty in your thermal conductivity, it's a PDF. You feed that into your energy equation. Can you predict the PDF of temperature? Now, one of the common ways this is done in the literature is through something called generalized polynomial chaos, GPC. So what does that mean? It mean the way that's done is uh, you have a thermal conductivity that is probabilistic and it is uh, expanded in a polynomial basis where Ki is a function of space and we have a polynomial uh, basis function, which is, uh, you know, you can choose polynomials of various order, but it's a function of the random variable in my thermal conductivity. So that's what makes my K random. So you know this going in. Uh, we also expand our temperature, which is really the output, also in a random, in a set of random basis polynomials uh, multiplied by uh, temp by these coefficients, temperatures, which are not really known. All right. So the whole idea is that you'd like to find these coefficients so that you know the randomness or you can predict your temperature as a random variable. So you have these expansions. The way you do this is you stick these in your governing equation. Uh, you perform what's called a Galakian projection to obtain separate partial differential equations for your unknown coefficients ti. So each one of them has a differential equation. You discretize and solve those PDEs. Uh, you get your polynomial back, and then you can, you know, find its variance and its mean simply by, uh, you know, taking the mean of this function and finding the variance of this function and so on, right? That's the way a GPC is typically done. Now you can do this, I mean, you can do this, but it's very intrusive because every time you, if you have a computation through a dynamics code, uh, you can't use that directly because each of these uh, TIs uh, require these uh, new PDEs that you derive for the coefficients. You've got to go off and find solution methods for these nonlinear PDEs. Uh, and so this becomes very, very complicated. Automatic code differentiation gives you a very interesting way of doing this quickly. So how do you do this? Uh, you expand all your variables in a polynomial basis, just like we said. Now, these variables are now templated as being of the polynomial chaos class, if that's what you want to call them. So every variable is not just one thing, but now contains all of its coefficients. So, so every variable carry, carries its coefficients AI. Uh, now, every operation has to be uh, overloaded. So for example, the multiplication operation is not just multiplication, but you can do some very complex uh, overloading. So the overload operation now multiplies two series together, does a Galakian projection, isolates the values of the independent variables, and you do this all so that you can actually take a regular CFD solver and convert it to one that actually processes PDFs, right? So that's the way we, we can do it. And so let me skip over this and show you some results. Very simple problem here, driven cavity, you know, the fodder of every CFD practitioner. So I've got a square cavity containing uh, a, a liquid or a fluid of some kind. Uh, the top wall moves, uh, right? And associated with that top wall motion is a Reynolds number. Now in this particular, this is, you know, the, uh, deterministic version of this is done you know, all the time to benchmark CFP codes. However, let's throw a little uh, vari variation in this. So I'm going to say that the viscosity, however, is not a known number. It's a uh, it's random number and it's a PDF and therefore it's got a, in this case, it's normally distributed and it's got a mean of, uh, you know, 1 kg per meter second and it's got a standard deviation of 0.1 kg per meter second. And so if the viscosity is random, of course, your velocity field now becomes a PDF. And our deal now is to predict uh, the mean of the velocity. I and mean, we want the whole PDF of the velocity field. And here what I'm showing you is the mean of the velocity field on the vertical center line. And I'm showing you uh, the standard deviation of the velocity field on the vertical center line and comparing it to Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, done, uh, so that's different from our uh, generalized polynomial chaos way of doing it. 
So what I, and this was done essentially by taking a regular CSV code and through templating and operator overloading, uh, create one that gives you this PDF of the velocity field at every single physical point in the flow, right? So you can, uh, you, you can use this to understand uh, your flow much better. Right now, so that's one thing. Now, the, now let's get back to the idea of uncertainty quantification across scales, right? Uh, that's that's one application of the whole idea of VQ across uh, of VQ. And here's an interesting problem we did some years ago, and this has to do with multi-scale heat conduction. And the question we ask ourselves is, how much uncertain? How does the uncertainty in MD simulations of thermal conductivity, how does it affect macro scale heat transfer problems, heat conduction calculus? So let's say that you want to calculate uh, Fourier conduction in a square, and uh, the boundary conditions here are that the top is insulated, the bottom three boundaries are a given temperature. You've got a material here whose thermal conductivity you're doing MD simulations to find thermal conductivity values. Of course, MD sim simulations are noisy, and uh, so the question is, how does this noise uh, change what you get at the macro scale? Right, it's an artificial problem, but it has all uh, the pieces that we're looking for. Right, so how do you do? How do you? How are we going to do this? You do MD simulations of the material that's in the square, uh, and then the atoms' uh, positions and velocities can be used to find phonon relaxation times. And from these four on relaxation times, thermal conductivity can be computed, and that can be fed into your macro scale simulation. But of course, your uh, MD simulations are very noisy, and uh, and the question is how do you, uh, you know, how much of that effect matters, right? So you've got an MD simulation. Uh, you find uh, you know you do MD simulation for a certain amount of time. Uh, that amount of time gives you uh, you know a, you can calculate something called the spectral energy density. We don't have to go into that. And from the spectral energy density, phonon relaxation times can be found. This is a relaxation time versus frequency at different temperatures, I believe is what's in there. So these are all different temperatures. And you can see that there are big error bars at any given frequency because MD simulations, if you repeat them over and over again, will give you a variability. Right, so now the question is, how do I represent? Uh, now, if you fold these relaxation times into your formula for thermal conductivity, you will get a big buzz in the thermal conductivity with respect to temperature. And how do I uh, represent that in my computation? Right, so here's where we use uh, Bayesian calibration to obtain a statistical model for the variability in thermal conductivity. So what is, this is a model. So we're going to say that uh, thermal conductivity is a function of this type, mu naught t to the mu one plus mu two plus a random term here, which is a PDF, which consists of uh, a new three times t plus a new four multiplied by a random variable eta, which is a normal distribution in this case. This is a model with a zero mean and a unit variance. Right, and so this uh, new, new three and new four are really uh, times eta are really uh, random parameters. So what we do is we calibrate use, using Bayesian calibration. Uh, we calibrate these random parameters to the noise in the data that we have. Right. So if you look at uh, the MD simulation data, there's a whole bunch of data at every given temperature. That's the noise. And we're using that noise to uh, calibrate our statistical model. And if you look at that calibration, I won't tell you, you know, the details of how it's done. Uh, you can get a PDF of that variable of these two variables, mu three and mu four. Right. So this is a pretty standard process. There is something called a uh, Bayes factor, which tells you how good is your the PDF that you're coming up with with respect to the PDF of noise that you have in your MD simulation. And a big number here means that it's a good representation. And it turns out to be that we are capturing the statistics of that noise well with our statistical model, with our Bayesian model. And so we use this uh, to do, uh, I'm going to skip over this. There's no big reason for you all to know this detail. 
I think so finally what you end up with is really a statistical distribution of temperature in your domain, right? So you've got a calculation domain here. I'm looking at uh, four different physical points, A, B, C, D. And at every physical point, we have the full probability density function of temperature resulting from the statistical distribution of noise in your MD simulation, right? So, uh, and, and different physical points have different uh, PDFs. Now, what you see here is uh, abstracting this PDF information just to give you uh, the, max, the uh, mean and the standard deviation of the temperature field. But of course, it's not just mean and standard deviation. We actually have uh, the full PDF available at every single point. Right, so, uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that the ideas of Bayesian uh, calibration and Bayesian uncertainty quantification can be used across scales. And similar ideas can be used uh, in very complex systems. Now, this is an example out of my, uh, you know, out of our, my old Prism Center, and uh, here we go. So here, what we're trying to do, uh, in, in what the center was trying to do, uh, was really a men's simulation. All right, and you see a representation of the device here. This is really a simple device. There is a me there's a metal membrane, you know, and you see that here. Uh, and sitting underneath, and uh, there's an air gap, and then there is a uh, an electrode here. A voltage difference is applied between the membrane and the electrode, and that causes this uh, membrane to deform, and it will snap shut, so it can act as a switch. And similarly, you can pull it out by releasing the voltage. And uh, the idea here is how do we predict the pullout voltage in this particular case? Okay, there's a lot of complexity uh, here. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a concatenation of scales, uh, atomistic level, uh, the surface roughness and all of these things. Uh, some of the properties are not well known, so they have to be calibrated, uh, you know, to get PDFs out of experiments. Uh, geometry and processing conditions are not well known, so things like residual stresses are uncertain. There are uncertain contact mechanics. So we've kind of folded all of this together to be able uh, to do many things. I mean, there's a Young's modulus that is computed from atomistics that is a PDF. Uh, there's a PDF of the surface uh, and therefore contact distances vary. Uh, there's residual stresses in the membrane that has been calibrated to experiments to give you a probabilistic view. And at the end of the day, when you fold it all in, what you actually end up with is a probability uh, density function of the pullout voltage. So you're not predicting one number anymore, but you're holding all of these scales into a prediction of uh, the PDF of pullout voltage. Right now, if this were, uh, you know, this is concentrated on about 12 volts, so you know that that's roughly what it's going to be, considering all of these process variations, uh, taking it all into account. Uh, and you can then begin to ask questions of how do I narrow this PDF further? Uh, and what do I need to change in this concatenation of uh, inputs and parameters and models in order to tighten uh, my prediction to the value that I actually want? Right? So that's where we are. So I want to close by saying uh, that the UQ framework is really in its infancy. We haven't done much of this in the thermal sciences at all. Uh, sensitivities and adjoints uh, of the type that I talked about can yield a lot of valuable meta information about your problem. You can learn a lot about the physics of your problem by looking at these things. Automatic code uh, differentiation allows you to use existing CFT codes by simply uh, operator overloading and templating. And so you can convert existing CFT codes into things that can give you a lot more information than what already exists. Uh, and so this is powerful. You can also use this framework to propagate uncertainty. So you can convert a regular CFT code into one that gives you PDFs. Uh, but there are still a lot of questions about uh, uncertainty quantification. Uh, large numbers of uncertain variables are very expensive with the existing methodologies. Uh, there's still important work to be done in representing model form uncertainty. So if you've got uncertainty in the turbulence models or properties or something else, how do you account for that honestly in figuring out how accurate your answers actually are, right? 
And then, of course, these are expensive computations. It's not, you know, a single point computation itself in CFD is expensive. Here we're talking about entire PDF, so it's many, many hundreds of uh, computations. That's very expensive. But, you know, I tend not to worry about that so much because computational power is growing. We're already doing, you know, hundreds of petas, you know, petaflops of simulations, exascale simulations are coming. Um, and so the future then, uh, I believe, is uh, is good. All right. So we we are at a place where we can start to build decision making frameworks using a combination of everything that we have: CFD experiments, uh, you know, expert opinion. You know, all of these can be represented in Bayesian probabilistic frameworks, which allow us now to start making decisions about very complex systems. Right. So I want to stop there and see if you have any questions. Yogi, the floor is yours. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jayati. Very interesting, very uh, thought-provoking uh, seminar. I think, uh, uh, I guess, uh, certainly uh, very different topic than I guess we normally sort of listen to. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, a um, uh, number of questions. I think there are some that are on the uh, chat that are already, maybe I can, Read these. You want to read okay. them up? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I could do that, uh, and you can just maybe answer those. So, great yeah. in-depth talk for the uncertainty propagation problem in multi-scale simulation. If we have multiple input parameters with uncertainties, how do we know their uncertainties will likely add up or cancel each other? Yeah, we don't. Uh, you know, that's a very good question. In fact, we don't know that they'll either add up or cancel each other, and in fact propagating them together through the system is the only way you can tell how these uncertainties interact because it depends on you know the black box that you have the black box of equations through which you're propagating these uncertainties it depends on how nonlinear those are and how these uncertainties interact so there's no way to tell up ahead that they're going to add up or that they're going to cancel you're going to have to actually do that propagation and then another one, uh, if automatic differentiation yields a gradient with one simulation slash solve, why would one ever use an adjoint method to obtain the same gradient? No, so it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, an adjoint is kind of different, right? It's sort of a back propagation uh, of, you know, uh, of gradients from the output to the input. The thing that I talked about here is a forward propagation of uh, input primes to the output all right so here uh, what we're doing is picking a a single input variable and we're looking at the variation of all outputs with respect to this single input right uh, but you may want to ask a different problem which is the adjoint problem which is uh, you know uh, what what is the set of inputs that affect a given output right we're asking the opposite thing here we're saying what is one how does one input affect all outputs uh, the adjoint problem is actually harder to do, but it talks about how, uh, you know, the opposite. That is, uh, to get a single output, what are the, the what is the influence of all inputs on a single output? So these are different things. I haven't talked about the adjoint point problem here at all. Okay. Uh, all right. I guess those are the two on the chat. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to. Uh, ask questions directly as well. That's fine too. Um, I was I was typing a question. This is Richie Wurz. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah. So I was typing it. So I'll, I'll just ask it. Um, when you were developing your Bayesian sur surrogate model to yeah. approximate the MD simulations, what did you use to determine the form of those models, right? So you had this with the the form of the model with the random term. Uh, how do you how you choose the the form of those models? And is there a, kind of a, a good history of, of how to do that? I mean, that's a good question. All right, so that's modeling too. So uh, Richie, you're talking about, for example, this representation, right, of K. Now. Right. So this form, the first term here is sort of physics, right? I mean, we know that K varies uh, in this way. This guy here is pure modeling. It is, uh, and so there is, of course, you know, approximation involved here as well. And uh, 
so there's not, you know, so, so this is pure modeling. It, it, it is what you uh, postulate to be true. And of course, you're calibrating these two random variables in such a way as to meet data, right? So let me get back to the previous one. Yeah. So here, here's what we saw. I'm sorry. Is that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, yeah. this is modeling. There's just not, uh, you know, we're saying that we would represent uh, this variability that we see in the MD simulation through a simple term. Now you can get more complicated than this, but we've chosen a very simple representation. And uh, Proof of uh, the fact that it's a good representation really lies in a Bayes factor, which is really saying how well this representation captures uh, this variability. All right, so uh, so you're right. I mean, you know, so this is an approximation, right? And it's uh, we're choosing a simple representation to see if we can capture the data. If it doesn't, then you're going to have to go back and complicate this more. So there's modeling involved there as well. Okay, thank you. So, Jedi, I wanted to talk, can I ask you a little bit more on this uncertainty estimation? So, for example, when we, you know, sort of, um, teach courses on measurements, et cetera, you know, you have basically, uh, you know, the bias and the precision components of the uncertainty in a given measurement. And, you know, at the end, you sort of try to combine those to come up with an uncertainty in a result, uh, right? So, uh, uh, basically, uh, so that's you know those are the types of things that one does in terms of experimental analysis of um, basically data analysis. But yeah. um, what the the techniques that you're talking about uh, they relate a little bit more to uh, looking at sort of computational uncertainties in quantities such as properties etc. And then seeing how they impact the result. Is there sort of a relationship between experimental uncertainty in the data and sort of computational uncertainty, do they get combined in any way? How? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, look, so when you do an experiment and let's say that you run an experiment many, many times and you get a different uh, answer every time, you can think about representing the experimental data as sort of mean and a standard deviation, or if you have enough data, you can actually plot a PDF, right, of your, uh, of your data. So in that sense, this is nothing different from that. So if you, you know, so for example, if you give me a standard deviation or an error bar on your data, I would interpret that as, you know, as a standard deviation and you, you've got a mean and a standard deviation. If you have enough data that you can actually get the whole PDF out of it, great. Otherwise we would need to model that as say a normal distribution or something like that. And that, error bar can be folded in. So, for example, let's say that you're not doing uh, MD simulation to get your thermal conductivity, right? In this particular case, you're doing MD simulation, but let's say that you're getting your thermal conductivity out of an experiment, right? And there, uh, what do you have? I mean, you've got uh, the thermal conductivity, which is a distribution that you have measured, right? You either measured a mean and a standard deviation, that's all the information you have, or you have so much information that you actually have, uh, you know, a PDF of K with respect, you know, with respect to the number of realizations that you have. Now, that can be uh, used in a probabilistic simulation directly or through a functional representation of the K that you have as a normal distribution or some other distribution, right? So, it's not conceptually different. These are really the same thing. And I guess early on when you were talking about uncertainty, you know, you talked about the aleatoric and the epistemic components. Are they in any way uh, uh, identifiable, let's say, in experimental measurements? Or how do you tell which is what? You, you can't. And in fact, in a Bayesian, in an experiment, you certainly cannot, right? Because you're getting, because you don't have a model. So as such, the, you're getting what you're getting. So they're all mixed up together. Right, you have no way of telling them apart. Um, so the answer that you get at the end of an experiment contains, you know, everything. You're just measuring it. Now, a Bayesian uh, framework also, in some sense, conflates these things. So let me go back to my early, early slide here. Uh, so a Bayesian framework also, in some sense, doesn't really, in the ultimate calculation, doesn't really care which is what, right? So, it, because it represents everything as a PDF. So, it represents aleatoric uncertainty 
typically your inputs are aleatoric, you know, somebody, you know, turns on the light or opens a window, you get a different input velocity or temperature, that's aleatoric. Uh, and, you know, we represent that through a PDF. Uh, and we also represent model form uncertainties, which are classic epistemic uncertainties as PDFs, right? So, uh, and how do we get the PDF? Uh, you assume a function, say a normal distribution of error in your model. And if you have experimental data, you will calibrate uh, that uh, in the normal distribution to give you a PDF tied to real values, because that is how you use your experimental data. And so the idea, so the process of Bayesian calibration essentially allows you to fix the error form of your, uh, the error in your model as a PDF. Right? That's the way Bayesian calibration is done. And now once you have a, a model form uncertainty or an error term in your differential equation that you calibrate with the data, you can uh, take all these things and then basically pass them through any kind of complex system that you have to get an output of PDF, right? So, so a Bayesian framework uh, represents all uncertainties, aleatoric and epistemic, as PDFs and uh, calibrates model form uncertainty terms to, you know, smaller experiments, you know, to, to try and figure out what this PDF of error would be. And then you can take all of these things and put them into far more complex uh, multi-scale or multi-system simulations to actually get the output PDF, looking at the effects of all of these things together. That's the framework that we're trying to use. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, very helpful. Let's see. Uh, okay. So, so Jayati, one of the question is on the turbulence side. With this framework, how do you uh, take care of intermittency kind of uh, challenges in turbulence? Uh, tell me more. I mean, so what, what do you mean? So, so when you have intermittency in your flow field, these are generally mm -hmm. happens once in 10,000 event, you will have certain challenges. If I want to know about uncertainty with the intermittent uh, uh, effects in the flow field, how do you get that through these kind of inputs? I mean, you'd have to, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to think about that one. I mean, you'd have to be able to represent it in some probabilistic way if you, you know, if it, it depends on what time scale you're looking at these. I mean, uh, I can think about how you might do that in some sufficiently long time scale where there are many intermittency events that could potentially be, you know, represented through some kind of probabilistic framework, you'd have to get to that point. Um, if you're just talking about individual events, then I don't know that a, uh, that this kind of, uh, you know, approach can help. I need to think a bit more about that. Oh, yeah. A couple more yeah, questions. Can I, uh, you can I quickly ask Go ahead, Andre, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, here's a question that I think kind of was wondering listening to you talk. Not that it was already uh, very complex, I would say. Yeah, it, it's clever, but still very complex. Have, uh, have, have you thought or the community thought about uh, looking or applying the same uh, framework to solving inverse problems? Uh, those are already ill posed, right? And, but there are techniques like regularization techniques to, let's say, you know, and these are very real and practical. I have a systemic system level output with inferences that I observe in my system. And I'm trying yeah. to understand which really, which one of the parameters, the thermal conductivity or boundary condition, or something else that has the greatest uh, actually impact. And what is the PDF of the distribution of this input? Yeah. Was, yeah. Was, that, was that looked at? Yeah, yeah. So there are, I mean, it's not looked at by zillions of people, but there is, I mean, we've got a couple of papers out on uh, design under uncertainty, optimization under uncertainty, those frameworks exist, yeah. Uh, relatively simple problems, haven't done anything real complicated, uh, but yeah, they exist. You can, you can do optimization under uncertainty and you can certainly ask the question, uh, if I want this particular output PDF, uh, what should I do to my inputs, right? How do I change the mean and the standard deviation of my inputs to, so as to get uh, a particular PDF that I want in my output? Yeah, those, those have been done. Yeah. 
Yeah, they've not been done a lot, but they've been done. So I guess Devesh, we have to be, of course, we have to be respectful of your time, Jayati. Devesh, how much more yeah. time do we have? There are a couple more questions, but we don't have to go through all of them. It depends on the time. I think we can uh -huh. ask the last question. So if Jati has okay, time, so we can ask. One, yeah. one about, you know, how do you integrate these uncertainty quantification approaches with uh, machine learning type approaches or data scientific approaches? Good question. I mean, I, you know, it's something to be thinking about. I can see that, uh, you know, machine learning kinds of approaches could be used in, you know, for example, uh, you know, fitting, you, know, you have a model for properties that is essentially a, a, an ML approach based on data. Now, the question is how do, you know, it should be possible for us in principle to be able to pass you know, uh, sensitivities and, you know, primes and uncertainties through uh, an ML uh, neural network model, for example. I've not seen it done. I'm just sort of mm -hmm. thinking how it could be done. Uh, you know, as long as you have the network and that is representable in a code, um, it should make it uh, differentiable and, and so sensitivities could potentially be passed through that. I believe that, in fact, has been done. I remember seeing some papers uh, along those lines, and people have been using automatic code differentiation in that way. So sensitivity certainly can be done. I don't know if I've seen full-on, uh, you know, UQ in that way, but I believe there are publications already looking at uh, sensitivities of neural nets uh, in the way that we've been talking about through automatic code differentiation. I believe there are already exists. So in that context, I mean, Partograde is very powerful, but if we encounter functions which are not differentiable, um, will this still I, work, sir? Well, I mean, it you know depends on what you mean, right? I mean, you know, we're talking about differentiating a code, and if the code has, uh, you know, uh, you know, if your code has the function, even if it, you know, if this, then that, you know, all of those things are workable. Uh, you know, we, we do that now. I mean, you know, we've written code where, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, these are not necessarily differentiable functions. They don't have to be differentiable. As long as you've got a code that uh, represents the function, you know, through whatever means, if you've got a hands and dust in your code and that's the way the function is represented, that becomes, uh, you can pass primes through that process. That should not be a problem. Katrina. So, Katrina, you can go ahead with your question. That's the last one. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a this is a really interesting talk for me. I come from a, a risk assessment world where we deal with uncertainties uh, that we would love to be able to have a lot of deeply detailed physics models about. Um, and so, I think with with your perspective, you have a lot of um, aleatory uncertainties that we don't have. But, but my question is, how do you deal with these epistemic uncertainties related to the fact that we don't have models of certain type of physical regimes or certain type of fluids, um, and that there are also causal factors that might influence the the model performance or the functioning of a system that might not be represented in the model. So, how are those captured in this uncertainty quantification framework? You'd have to represent them in some statistical way, right? So, so uh, I see this because I have to get to a later slide. Let me try and do this one second. So, you know, going back to my uh, example with the multi-scale, uh, you know, thermal conductivity uh, calculation, right? So, typically, now this is a, in a sense, a model for thermal conductivity, all right? And and we have epistemic uncertainty here in that there is a statistical variation of K whose form we don't actually know, right? And I'm modeling that error here to a, uh, a model term, uh, which involves, in this case, a normal distribution, et cetera. So that's the way I've seen it done with all Bayesian uh, uncertainty quantification. So for example, if you've got, you know, in my particular case, we were looking at MEMS. Uh, we have, a, you know, creep in my MEMS, and there is a creep model, and there are uncertainties in my creep model. I don't know the form of the creep model that actually works. So there is epistemic uncertainty there. 
And so the way we typically end up doing it is exactly like we're doing it here. That is, we take the, you know, uh, in this case of thermal conductivity, we don't know the form of it precisely. So I'm adding a statistical error term here, right? And this is an epistemic uncertainty we're trying to model. And what we're doing here is calibrating this error term to MD simulation data, right? But of course, it doesn't have to be MD simulation, right? You've got experimental data. You go off and uh, calibrate your statistical term to experimental data so that at the end of the day, what you're getting is a PDF of this error term, right? And that's the way people do it in Bayesian, in Bayesian representations of model form uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty. So you're representing your lack of knowledge to a statistical model. And that statistical, the form of that error term is calibrated to whatever data measurements you've got, which gives you, uh, you know, a statistical representation of your lack of knowledge, essentially. So that's the framework that we've been using. Okay. Th thank you, JP, for the great talk. And thank you, Yogi, for moderating it. It's, it's, it's more than 15 minutes, what I had thought we'll end at 4.45. So thank you for extra time. All right, wonderful. Thank you all. It's been great fun. Uh, lovely seeing old friends again. Uh, you all stay safe and we really got to continue to do this. This is a lot of fun to do this right across the country with all kinds of uh, all our entire community here. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jati. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Jati. Thank you.